In this week's drive, we get really close to the motorcycle industry. Get really, really close to what's on show on four wheels. See what they'll be driving when they grow up. And keep the past alive and purring. All this and more in this week's Drive. We start this week with a look at a typical motor show. For many motorists, especially city dwellers, this is their best chance to see, and even drive, all the latest models in the same place at the same time. For enthusiasts, motor shows are a chance to see exotics, concept cars and new designs up close. Most of the world's major manufacturers put on large and lavish displays in the interests of showcasing their new models, demonstrating their technology and publicizing their racing efforts. For others, like this young would-be world champion, it's a rare chance to get a hands-on experience that's as good as it gets. The PlayStation will never feel the same again after this. For example, Japanese car maker Honda have been displaying their flagship Civic, and the company is hoping that it will make a comeback in Europe and claim significant sales volumes through new diesel-powered models. The planned diesel-powered version of the Civic Compact is due to go on sale in several European countries during January. High oil prices, much lower fuel consumption, dramatically improved performance and cleaner exhaust emissions have made diesel-powered passenger cars extremely popular in Europe. The solidly built Civics will be offered in several variations of specification, the top draw models getting close to rivaling European brands like Audi, BMW and Volkswagen. French carmaker Citroën had a trio of new models. The essence of the 21st century, the Citroën C-Sport Lounge concept car combines powerful sleek lines with 2 plus 2 refinement. With coupe-like styling and limo-like comfort and refinement, the C6 builds on Citroën's heritage of executive cars. Peugeot showed various models, but their sales hopes were pinned on the 407 coupe, a full four-seater with a large boot. And yes, along with two petrol V6 engines, it also comes in a diesel-powered version. German carmaker Opel had a high-performance version of their popular Astra at the center of attention, and they weren't scared of getting it wet either. They showed power-up versions of several models, plus the intriguing Antara light four-wheel drive concept car too. Needless to say, diesels made the grade here too. But significantly, no less than four Chinese car makers attended the show, although only two laid their products before the critical eyes of European motor show goers. Neither Nanjing Automotive, the new owners of MG Rover, nor rivals Shanghai Automotive Industry Corporation put on a display. Geely Motors showed a small saloon called Free Cruiser and a small family-sized saloons badged FC and M303H, a small family hatchback called Haojing, and a sports car charmingly called the CD, or Chinese Dragon. Geely has recently signed a deal with a Lisbon-based importer to distribute these cars in Spain and Portugal, and is looking for partners to sell them in other European countries. Geely, whose name means good luck, and which is one of China's few independent car makers, made more than 100,000 cars last year, a little less than the annual run of BMW's smallest luxury car, the 1 Series. This year, Geely expects to build more than 140,000 units across its five-car range and double its exports to 10,000, which are sold mostly in North Africa, the Middle East and Central America. European and US car makers are concerned that once Chinese cars come of age and meet strict environmental regulations, they'll start to flood into the rest of the world, undercutting older car makers on price. Geely's cars start at $4,000 for its smallest, most basic runaround, rising to $10,000 for larger, sportier models. So much for the way things are done in Europe. The biggest motor show in Asia is the Tokyo Show, held close to the end of each year. Over 245 companies from 14 countries participated, exhibiting more than 600 cars, 79 of them for the first time. And while it's tough to impress motorists who are used to seeing hybrids and zero-emission fuel cell cars on the road, some at this show were trying hard. In light of sky-high oil prices, most Japanese manufacturers have devoted themselves to exploring eco-friendly high-mileage cars. Toyota, Japan's top motor maker, showcased a concept model with fuel cell and hybrid technologies, as well as the luxury Lexus brand. 
We achieved far better fuel economy by improving hybrid engines, so I think this car fits with the times. Particularly, the Japanese car makers are constantly looking for new markets with eco-friendly technology. Officially, their Honda Sports 4 concept was just that, a concept car only. But it is fully operational and a clear pointer to the styling of the next generation Accord Euro. Honda is big on concept cars, often never intended to go into production like this one. Some are design exercises and demonstrate technical expertise. Others are thinly disguised production-ready models shown a few months ahead of launch so that final styling options can be decided before production starts. Suzuki, just one of three major companies along with Honda and BMW to build both cars and motorcycles, showed their military-influenced PX concept. The slabby PX is actually one of Suzuki's nicer designs. The Ionis shows how eco-virtuous cars are changing. It matches its fuel cell with an electric motor powertrain, driving the front wheels, to a designer interior with Swiss aluminium and leather seats, and the body changes color depending on the light. Mazda showed their Senku concept car, a four-seater rotary engine sports car that features massive electrically operated sliding doors. The sleek body suggests the direction of Mazda's next generation styling. A two-stage power-operated hatch lid moves up and out, and the rearmost part of the glass roof has solar panels that help charge the hybrid battery. The Tokyo show is held in a series of huge halls, and over a million people attend just this one show every year. The UFE3 is the third of Daihatsu's ultra-fuel economy prototypes and is the best yet. It weighs just 440 kilos, and its three-cylinder engine with twin electric motors returns 72 kilometers per litre. No motor show would be complete without a display of mouth-wateringly beautiful, unashamedly powerful hand-built Italian exotics. And these are the latest models from Lamborghini. Citroën are working hard to build a customer base in the heart of Japan. Stylish young Japanese delight in having something a little different, like the C4. Nissan, the Japanese company owned by Renault of France, was to spring a couple of surprises. One of the stars of the show, the Pivo, is an electric car with a unique revolving cabin, multiple drive-by-wire systems and excellent visibility. The Pivo's cabin revolves through 360 degrees, eliminating the need to reverse, while excellent visibility helps reduce dangerous blind spots. Carlos Goen, president of Nissan, is very much a car person, and he loves to lend a personal touch to the face of the company. Pivo can easily pass oncoming traffic, even on the narrowest streets, and it's a cinch to park in the tightest of spots. It seats three passengers comfortably, despite an overall length of just 2.7 meters. The driver sits front and center, while two passengers sit side by side in the rear. Tall, electrically powered sliding doors make it easy to get in and out. And with Pivo, the steering, braking, shifting, and other functions are electronic not mechanical. The rotating cabin perfectly illustrates the freedom that X by wire creates by eliminating mechanical connections between the cabin and the chassis. Naturally, Pivo is electrically powered. Just don't expect to see one in a dealer's showroom near you anytime soon. Toyota's Finex is a fuel cell hybrid vehicle which aims for a sense of hospitality through power welcome seats that move in and out as the gullwing doors open widely to assist getting in and out of the vehicle. It combines the environmental performance of a hybrid system and four-wheel independent drive control and a large steering angle mechanism. There is only steam discharged by the Finex. It will not pollute the air, no matter how far you drive in it. The four wheels can move freely and independently, thanks to the motors installed in each wheel. Such high technology offers easier manoeuvring, while improving safety measures to prevent accidents. Fuel cell vehicles use a chemical reaction between hydrogen and oxygen to generate electricity and emit only water. Honda's silent zero-emission FCX is already on the road. It was the industry's first test of hydrogen-powered vehicles and became the first fuel cell vehicle in the world to receive government certification. The latest version delivers 15% more torque than previous prototypes and improves mid- to high-range power output and acceleration. 
It also has a driving range of 220 miles, about 10% more than the previous model. Inside the car, an LCD screen that shows the driver a map while passengers can watch a video. Two different images are displayed on the same screen, and what you see depends on the angle that you look at it from. Is that all too techy? If so, Honda have a dog-friendly car, the WOW. A crate for dogs in the dash allows owners to interact with pets while driving, and a bigger crate pops up from the floor in the back and can be folded back into the floor when it's not needed. For even bigger dogs, just buckle them up with a special seat belt to the floor. <laughs> Stealing the show, though, was Toyota's iSwing. This single-seat vehicle is a combination of engineering and artificial intelligence and is aimed at inner-city dwellers. iSwing learns the habits of its drivers, in this case Toyota President Katsuaki Watanabe, and customizes itself accordingly. At walking speed, it runs upright on two wheels. Faster, it reclines and uses a third. It may have a use in crowded cities, but it looks like Toyota has answered a question that no one's bothered to ask. British alternative fuel vehicles were displayed in Trafalgar Square in the heart of London. On show were alternative fuel-driven taxis, scooters, laptops, cars and buses, even microwaves. It's part of the 9th Grove Fuel Symposium, and its aim is to educate people on the nuts and bolts of what fuel cells are all about, and how they can be applied to everyday consumer items, particularly vehicles. It's still very much on the small scale. Uh, I wouldn't think there's more than about 200 worldwide on the roads, but there are 200 on the road, and uh, they're working very well. So it's, it's proving that the technology works, demonstrating to the public that it's, it's real, it's not high in the sky, it's not long off research that you're never gonna see, this is real. Mass production of this hydrogen-powered bike could be 18 months away. The power pack unclips from between the rider's knees and can be carried inside for recharging. And despite its lightweight looks, it can be taken off-road. Our machine is light uh, and it runs on hydrogen. Uh, it'll do 100 miles on 5 ounces of compressed hydrogen and it'll emit only water vapour. We think that it's, it's going to have to be launched in a very targeted way. In fact, the fact that it only uses five ounces of hydrogen per fill-up means that actually it would be possible to put mobile refueling stations in or even for people to keep a gas canister at home and refuel the bike at home. Delegates at the 9th Grove Fuel Cell Symposium were told that consumer electronics offered an obvious route forward. With 470 million consumer electronic devices requiring portable power, it could represent a fuel cell business worth about $25 billion. Twenty-three robotic vehicles designed to operate without human guidance set off just after sunrise recently to navigate their way through a desert obstacle course in a U.S. military-sponsored race. Modified Humvees, SUVs, pickup trucks and dune buggies were required to navigate through hills, valleys, dry lake beds and man-made obstacles over 210 kilometers to win a $2 million prize being offered by the Pentagon. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, better known as DARPA, is hoping to spur the development of driverless vehicles that could one day carry supplies for the U.S. military in war zones. The rugged, twisting course, located about 64 kilometers southwest of Las Vegas on the Nevada-California border, was chosen because of its similarity to the places where the U.S. military is currently most active. The driverless vehicles had to cross over railroad tracks and squeeze through narrow passes. The vehicles, kicking up a cloud of dust, left the starting gate one by one every five minutes, passed a crowd of about 2,000 spectators and headed off into the Nevada desert. Last year, in the inaugural race sponsored by DARPA called the Grand Challenge, every single machine failed within sight of the starting line. Using global positioning satellites and inertia navigation, the vehicles are programmed to follow a predefined course, disclosed only hours before the race. Radar, lasers and cameras send data to onboard computers that steer the vehicles around obstacles. Organizers limited the race to 10 hours. 
The Stanford Racing Team, a team from Stanford University, eventually won the event and collected the $2 million first prize. Using a modified Volkswagen Touareg diesel called Stanley, the team completed the course in 6 hours and 54 minutes with an average speed of 30 kilometers an hour. Two other teams were close behind, each 10 minutes adrift, while a fourth, using a modified Mack truck, finished but outside the 10-hour cutoff limit. While Stanley is in motion, its environment is seen through four laser rangefinders, a radar system, a stereo camera pair, and a monocular vision system. All processing takes place on board on seven Pentium M computers, powered by a battery-backed electronically controlled power system. The vehicle uses measurements from its GPS, a 6DOF inertial measurement unit, and wheel speed sensors to determine where it is. Stanley is actuated via a drive-by-wire system developed by Volkswagen America's Electronic Research Lab. By hosting the event, the U.S. military is aiming to comply with a congressional mandate for a third of U.S. military vehicles to be unmanned by 2015. The holiday season is an ideal time for parents to create a habit of making sure young children who have outgrown child safety seats are seated in a back seat of a vehicle and are properly restrained in a booster seat. A recent study commissioned by the American Safety Council's airbag and seatbelt campaign found that fatalities to children under 12 years old have dropped 18% overall since 1996 because more parents are properly restraining children in a back seat. That amounts to hundreds of lives saved a year. Or out the front of the car. How's that? But one area where more needs to be done is for children too big for infant or toddler seats, but not yet big enough for safety belts alone, to best protect them in a crash. In this test, watch the lap belt. You're going to see it in the abdominal area. It's going to tighten around that soft abdominal tissue. And in a real world crash, what we would see is a child with potential liver spleen and spinal column injuries. This is a child who is properly restrained in a booster seat. We have the lap belt going across his hips. The hips are the strongest part of the body and by having the lap belt there we keep it out of this soft abdominal area. The shoulder belt goes across the center of the shoulder. It's not rubbing on his face or neck. It's very comfortable and as an added benefit he can see outside when he's traveling so he's going to sit comfortably and happily while he's traveling. One parent was so concerned about the number of kids at his son's preschool who were not using booster seats that he did his own research and wrote a letter to the school principal, who copied it and sent it to other parents. I witnessed some parents not placing children in booster seats or placing them in the front seat where there were airbags. Parents don't know that the major killer of children under 15 is in a car accident. So I duplicated that information and sent it out to 90 families and they were most appreciative. Safety experts recommend that children should be in a booster seat until they weigh 45 kilos and are 1.45 meters tall. Adults who volunteer to transport additional children should arrange to borrow appropriate booster seats if they do not have enough for each child that they transport. There are over a million motorcycle riders in Britain, and over 180,000 of them went to Birmingham for the International Motorcycle and Scooter Show. Set in what used to be the heart of the British motorcycle industry, the exhibition has showcased the latest technology since 1931. As well as the latest machines from Japan, the US and Europe, this year's show saw launches from Britain's last remaining bike builders, Triumph and CCM. 250 related companies display products and services. This show represents the whole motorcycle industry. Anything and everything to do with two wheels is here. Um, it's the motorcycle industry in the UK at its best. Despite concerns over safety and the notorious British weather, government figures for bike sales in Britain show that they are at their highest in five years. There was a 14% increase in bikes sold compared with the same period in 2004, while car sales fell by 5%. Motoring experts blame massive fuel price increases, hikes in parking charges and new restrictions and charges for cars travelling into major city centres like London for the move from four wheels to two. 
The industry in Britain is it's not like it was in the 1950s, but it's a healthy sector, growing 15,000 people and turning over two and a half billion pounds a year. Major economic driver. At 103 years old, one of the oldest names in the industry, Triumph, launched its latest model. The British company was the biggest brand in the world during its heyday in the 1960s and 70s. Since its rebirth in 1991, its products no longer target the mass market. Instead, Triumph has rebuilt its reputation as a niche manufacturer. In the UK, we are the number one non-Japanese non manufacturer, so we're above uh, the Americans, the Italians, um, and we're commanding a, a good chunk of market share worldwide. We're doing very, very well. In terms of our growth last year, I think we are the number one growth brand in motorcycling worldwide. Another British company launching its latest product at the show was Clues Competition Machines, or CCM. They produce many of their machines by hand. Like Triumph, the 35-year-old company is anxious to avoid the mistakes of the past. We can compete in the mainstream market with the Japanese and the Europeans. So um, we had to come up with a product that um, fitted, fitted a niche, niche area and uh, was different and couldn't instantly be uh, compared to a Honda or a Yamaha or whatever. For visitors too small or too young to actually ride the bikes on offer, there were two-wheeled simulators, video games and workshops. The organisers claim that the show was the most innovative and interactive of its kind. With launches by the major manufacturers from Japan, Europe, the United States and Britain, it was one of the biggest biking events ever staged in the UK. Car lovers in India's southern city of Madras were treated to the sight of over 60 vintage 1930s and 1950s models, which breezed past them in a rally of classic cars. The event was organised to promote the need to preserve these cars as a national heritage. The cars, many still in peak condition, were judged on the quality of their restoration, original colours and working condition. Organised by the Madras Heritage Car Club, the rally was a well-attended event. The growth of museums and car rallies and accompanying media attention has increased the level of interest in heritage cars in India. Some old-timers felt owning a vintage car was like owning a piece of history. In vehicles bearing names like Singer, Packard and Citron to Buick, Vauxhall and Fiat, car lovers from across the country participated in the rally. A renowned classic car expert from the eastern city of Calcutta judged the vehicles. The members' cars are judged for aesthetics, performance, functional aspects, as well as originality of the car. So that being the case, gives a platform for them, for them to expose what all they've painstakingly restored all these years and maintained it also. See, we don't get a chance to know how it was restored, but this is a platform to explain to the judge what all went into restoration. Whether it's a bar the first car came to India in 1900, and within 10 years, there were several thousand vehicles on the country's roads. Until India gained independence from Britain in 1947, princes and industrialists were the biggest patrons of luxury cars. Anticipating the need for cars in India, General Motors set up their own assembly in Mumbai in 1927. And within 10 years, GM India Limited could build 11,000 cars and trucks per year. Now, more than 75 years later, India boasts a sizable collection of vintage cars. So whether you're in a spin, not sure which way to turn, or just finding the easiest way to park, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.